Welcome back, folks. Uh, this is going to be chapter 18, part A, on the cell division cycle. So most of you are familiar with how mitosis is divided into five distinct phases involving the nuclear division. But you may not know that mitosis is not independent of the cell cycle. So the cell cycle is the bigger brother of mitosis. So in order to get a handle on the cell cycle, we need to review the cell cycle first, and then we'll see how proteins control different components of the cell cycle. And then we'll look at each individual phase of the cell cycle before, in the next video, delving deeper into how mitosis itself is controlled. The learning objectives for this entire chapter are listed here in gross. And as I mentioned earlier, then they'll be broken down even further uh, in a PDF file. So we expect the students to know the four phases of the cell cycle and the key events which occur in each phase. Then to understand in detail, and this is the gist of this video, the role of cyclins, which are proteins, and cyclin dependent kinases, which are also proteins that partner up with the cyclins and their role in the cell cycle and how they are regulated themselves to ensure that the cell cycle proceeds in a regulated fashion. Then students should be able to give examples of how mutations in these cyclins and cyclin dependent kinases can impact cells and cause all kinds of issues. Students find the cell cycle daunting because of the similarity between different components and the reuse of the same names again and again. Uh, this should not be the case, and that's the intent of this video, to simplify uh, those processes. So here's a quick overview of the cell cycle control elements, which we have to learn. So from chapter one, we learned about the cell theory, in that all existing cells come from pre-existing cells. So there's no way at the moment uh, in which cells can proof into existence or be made in the lab. The cell cycle is an orchestrated series of events which duplicates cellular components, including the DNA, and then segregates them, that is, divides them evenly into the two daughter cells. So basically, it's a duplication event first and then a division event second. During this cell cycle, membrane is expanded so that each daughter cell gets an adequate amount, both plasma membrane and internal membranes. Organelles are duplicated. Mitochondria and chloroplasts will be duplicated in a fashion very similar to how bacteria replicate using binary fission, but all other organelles will be duplicated utilizing eukaryotic principles. And of course, the DNA itself has to be duplicated. And we learned about how that happens with replication forks in chapter six. The cell cycle is controlled basically by the set of proteins known as kinases. And kinases, as we know, are proteins which add phosphate groups to their target molecules. So it appears that the process of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation is the key to understanding the cell cycle and how those processes can be regulated on top by other proteins. The cell cycle has checkpoints at various spots, which are like quality control steps, where the proteins do a quick inventory of the biochemistry of the cell. And if things are... <coughs> If things are not well, then the cell cycle can be halted. If things are doing well, then the cell cycle is allowed to proceed. And we'll see that uh, in multiple places. And then finally, in the second half of the chapter, they address programmed cell death and how that's important to prevent issues such as cancer and badly duplicated DNA from being passed on to daughter cells. Let's begin at a holistic level, a 30,000 view, if you may, of how cell cycle proceeds. 
So the first phase of the cell cycle is to sequester energy and food supplies so that the cell has enough of both in order to complete the cell cycle. So the cell cycle has a beginning point somewhere, and that's normally presented around 12 o'clock on a dial such as this. And as the cell progresses, the first thing it does, it copies its DNA. So DNA replication is an independent event from the production of two cells, and we need to remember that. So during a particular phase, as we'll find out shortly, DNA is replicated. And then there's a quality control step to make sure that all the DNA was replicated. And then the cell is allowed to enter the M phase, the nuclear division phase, where the DNA is segregated into two parts of the same cell. And then the cell it divides into two daughter cells. So the mother cell starts life here. She goes through DNA duplication, and then DNA segregation, and then she splits into two daughter cells. The time it takes for cells to undergo the complete cell cycle varies from species to species. Here is a short list just to give you an idea. So frog embryos, which are rapidly dividing, are doing so in about 30 minutes for each cycle. Yeast cells, on the other hand, which are dividing regularly, do so in about one and a half hours. Uh, human cells vary from place to place. Some cells don't divide at all. But other cells, which are necessary to replace existing cells, do so in about 12 hours to about one full day. So here we have epithelial cells, such as the ones lining your digestive system. Uh, they can undergo the cell cycle in about 12 hours. Whereas those cells in the Petri dish, under different conditions, may only do so once every 24 hours. But this is for the entire cycle. Uh, the, the mitosis phase of the cell cycle can last about one hour in humans. So you can see most of the time is spent in other parts of the cell cycle, not the actual segregation of the nuclei. At the most fundamental level, we wish you to learn that the cell cycle can be easily divided into four phases. The first phase is called G1, and G stands for gap, because under the microscope, nothing is happening. But now more and more books are talking about growth phase, because the cell, as we said earlier, is sequestering energy and food molecules. The second phase is the S phase, which stands for synthesis, and that's for synthesis of DNA. And that phase, DNA replication begins, and then by the end of S phase, DNA replication shut down. Then there's a second gap phase, G2, which allows the cell, again, to sequester the biochemistry necessary for the last phase and to build up its reserves. So that's called gap two. Once gap two is finished, then we enter the M phase, or in this case, mitosis. And the M phase is where the nucleus divides initially, followed very quickly by the cell dividing into two. So the word that students forget is cytokinesis. Cyto means cell, kinesis means split. So that's where the cell splits into two daughter cells. Whereas mitosis stands for the mitotic uh, segregation of the chromosomes. So there are your four phases. This chapter section focuses on three main points along the cell cycle. The first point is called the G1 checkpoint. So this is a quality control step that the proteins within the cell perform before the cell is allowed to enter the DNA duplication S phase, a very important point. In some books, that's called the R1 or the restriction one point. In our textbook, they call it the start point too. Regardless, this checkpoint exists. A cell, if it doesn't pass this checkpoint, can return back to the beginning and not divide. But once this checkpoint has been overcome, then the cell has no alternative but to finish the cell cycle or the cell will die. Another checkpoint is right here, just before mitosis or M phase. Here, the checkpoint called the G2 checkpoint has the proteins check the biochemistry to make sure that all the DNA was duplicated 
and that none of that DNA has sustained any major damage that still remains unrepaired. And the third major checkpoint happens two-thirds of the way through M phase, when the chromosomes are about to be segregated in the phase called anaphase. And we'll talk about these phases in more detail in the next video or this chapter, but for now uh, there's an important point here where the copied chromosomes are pulled apart so that one copy can end up in each daughter cell. So that's another checkpoint within mitosis. So these are the major checkpoints, not the only ones, but the ones that we have to learn about. One bit of exciting news about the cell cycle system is that it's very old. It's an old system that was devised over a billion years ago, and since then, little has changed. What that means is that proteins in humans can be placed into defective yeast cells, and those yeast cells can then be restored to normal biochemical health. So it seems that little has changed in the way that these proteins interact with each other. So that allows us to study different creatures for different aspects of the cell cycle and apply that knowledge to ourselves or other creatures. So these cross studies are permissible because of the conservative nature of this very old system. Let's now delve into the nitty gritty, uh, the part that the students need to learn. The cell cycle is controlled, as we said earlier, by proteins. And those proteins are key to having every phase do what it's supposed to do and not proceed until things are ready. So the activity of the cell cycle is controlled by kinases and their cousins called cycling dependent kinases. So on this slide here, the book has broken those two types of proteins into these color coded segments. So the cycling is in green that's a protein, it itself doesn't have any biochemical enzymatic activity. But its partner, the cyclin-dependent kinase, it has the ability on its surface to add phosphate groups to other commodities within the cell, other proteins and other biochemical elements. The first important thing to understand is that the red molecule, the kinase, the cyclin-dependent kinase, is inactive unless it is partnered up with the cyclin. And it's important to also understand that the level of the kinase inside the cell remains constant. So its level never changes. It's always there somewhere in the background. But the levels of cyclin can be altered by the cell depending on activity and the phase of the cell cycle. So that's why this name is called cyclin, because these proteins cycle throughout the cell, as we'll show you in a few seconds. The other learning objective is the way that these cyclines function and how they are themselves are turned on and off. So the most common method of controlling their behavior and the behavior of them themselves is through phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. So these are the fundamental paramount ways in which the system is regulated. So. In order to turn the cycling on and off, its surface is phosphorylated. In order for it to do its job, it phosphorylates other things. So that phosphorylation event applies both to the cyclins and their kinases, as well as the, the target molecules that they interact with. So let's just focus on the green part, uh, the green protein in the previous two slides. So the cycling itself is indicated here in this graph the levels of cycling alternate as one cell becomes another cell and that becomes another cell. So here we have the end of one cell cycle, the beginning of a second cell cycle, and then the third cell cycle. So in this continuous process of parent, daughter, and granddaughter cell, we can see and monitor how the levels of the cycling protein change over time for a particular type of cycling. So this one is called M-cycling for the mitosis phase of the cell cycle. So its level controls mitotic activity. One thing to relate from this figure is that the concentration of the cycling increases gently over the phase of the cell cycle, but its activity is dramatically turned on and off at a certain level. So there must be something strange going on 
with respect to how it interacts with its kinates and why there's a sudden increase in activity and then a sudden decrease in activity. So those are the two components that we're going to learn in the next few moments. Here is another chart showing two cyclins and how they interact with the cell cycle. Not three as we learned earlier, these are just two. So here we've superimposed S cyclin on top of the green line for the mitotic cyclin. So the S cyclin stands for the synthesis phase. So you can see its level increases during this phase of the cell cycle, late G1, then it stays constant doing something within the cell cycle, and then its level abruptly changes in the early phases of the M cycle. Whereas, as we saw in the previous slide, the concentration of the M cyclin starts to increase during G2, then it does something at the beginning of M phase, and then it too dramatically declines at a particular point in the M phase. And then the levels of both those cyclins are very low inside the cell and kept that way until the next cell cycle begins. Thus, in conclusion, different cyclins are present in different concentrations during different phases of the cell cycle. The upper number of cyclins that we have to learn in this chapter is four. And then we can see there's a relationship between the phase of the cell cycle and which cyclin is going to be active the most at that point. And also it's kinase partner. So the cyclins are numbered, sorry, the cyclins are labeled with letters and the kinases are numbered. So during the G1 phase, cyclin D concentration increases and as it does so, it interacts with these ever-present uh, cyclin-dependent kinase 4 and cyclin-dependent kinase 6. The levels of the kinase, the cyclin-dependent kinase, the red molecule, is kept at a steady level throughout the cell cycle. So their genes are on at a low level and their degradation is kept to a minimum so that their concentration doesn't vary. That's not true for the cyclin components. Their activity is increased at a particular time in the cell cycle and then suddenly they're destroyed, all of them, at once. So there are none left within the cell. So if you go back to this figure, you can now understand how the concentration of the cyclin can be altered in a cell. So there's increased transcription at this point until you reach a very high concentration of protein within the cytosol and then suddenly all the proteins are destroyed as well as gene expression being shut down for those proteins. So that's a very important understanding to have about how cycling concentrations are controlled within cells. The other message emerging from this figure is that when the cycling and the kinase come together first, they are inactive. And that activity has to be then regulated by various other proteins. So in this case, you can see, uh, just as an example, that the active site of the enzyme is ready to do its job, but the enzyme itself, the kinase, has been inhibited by the addition of extra phosphates somewhere else on its surface. So until these phosphates are removed, the activity, the active site of the enzyme cannot do its job. So what happens next is that other proteins which are monitoring the health of the cell, they then decide when to remove the inhibition on the kinase, therefore allowing the kinase, once its inhibition has been removed, uh, to become activated. So this whole complex is now ready to go to work. And what it does, it affects a lot of other proteins within the cell, which are responsible for progression into the next phase of the cell cycle. I found this slide in a secondary cell biology textbook, Lodish, and they do a pretty good job of explaining with this example in a yeast how the cycling component and the kinase component can go through a sequence of phases to become activated at the end. So here we have the two separate proteins. Once the cycling is made, it finds its partner, the kinase, which is always there, and they form an inactive factor complex. Then another protein, 
which is involved in monitoring the behavior of the cell, decides that it's time to phosphorylate one of the amino acids on the kinase. But that itself is not enough. Another protein monitoring another aspect of the cell can also apply a second phosphate at a different amino acid on the kinase. And the system is still off. But when the conditions are suitable, another protein, CDC25, comes along and it removes the phosphate from the first of those amino acids. And that makes the active site in this complex functional. And that can then go and find its target molecules and progress the cell through to the next phase of the cell cycle. Here is a quick summary of some of the information we've just learned. So CDC is simply a label for cell division cycle. So those are proteins that were found in the past during these investigations. CDK stands for the catalytic subunit, the kinase of the complex. And the cycling is the regulatory subunit of the complex, because without it, uh, the, the kinase is not functional. And they form a heterodimer. And if you look back to chapter four, a heterodimer simply is two proteins of a different type working together, and they perform phosphorylation. Neither one can work alone. And they may activate or inactivate target molecules. I mentioned a little while ago that the concentration of the cyclin, the green part, increases gently and then suddenly disappears. Let's talk about the suddenly part, and that's indicated by these purple arrows. So what happens to the cyclin component at that point in cell cycles? Well, the answer is simple, and you're familiar with that. The cell decides to remove all the cyclins so that this system can move on to the next phase of the cell cycle. And that's achieved by the addition of ubiquitin to just the cycling components. And they are then dragged away to be destroyed. And as we know now, the kinase component is inactive without its partner. So that's basically been turned off until in a future time, the cyclins are regenerated by gene expression. So this is another important concept that students need to relate to. Let's re-emphasize that phosphorylation is a general tool that's used by all these proteins to regulate each other, more or less. So once again, reiterating what we learned earlier, uh, when the two subunits come together, the cyclin and the kinase, they are normally stored in an inactive state. So as the concentration of cyclin builds up, the presence of a second protein called V1 it adds to the kinase a phosphate, and that basically shuts down the active site of this complex. That allows these complexes to build up in a gentle fashion until they're needed. Now, when they're needed, another protein, in this case, human CDC25, it comes along and it activates all the proteins in a more or less single fashion by removing the phosphate, and that turns on the active site of the cyclin complex. So V1 and CDC25 are both doing their jobs in charging the molecule and then activating it. So those are very important words that we can utilize. There is a second very powerful mechanism for inactivating the cyclin complex. And that's indicated here in this example, by a very prominent protein called P27, protein 27. So we can see a cyclin kinase complex here is doing its job, and then something is sensed that's not right in the cell, and the P25 is activated, and the P25 surrounds the cyclin kinase complex, basically turning it off for that duration. So by covering up the smaller proteins, the larger protein, the P27, basically inhibits further activity of that cyclin-dependent kinase. We are now in a position to put some of the pieces together to understand how the cell cycle can be regulated. So let's try to apply that again. We learned earlier that there are three important stages at which the cell cycle is controlled 
and they are reiterated here. So this is the first phase, this is the second phase, and that was the third phase. So as the levels of cyclin increase, the cell is checking with other proteins to make sure that everything is in order. And if something is in order, the concentration of the cyclin will continue to increase until a critical stage is reached. For instance, here, the same thing would happen here and the same thing would happen here. And at that point, the cell has a lot of its proteins phosphorylated that control the cell cycle. And that phosphorylation enables the cell to trip over to the next phase of its activity. However, if things are not right, then other proteins can come along and prevent or inhibit the kinase activity of the cycling complex, therefore either delaying or stopping completely the progression into the next phase of the cell cycle. So think about it. A red light will stop you from going any further down the road. And if this is the road, then there's a traffic light here. And that traffic light is very powerful. But there are other traffic lights in the way too. And if those traffic lights are red, then the cell will halt until they go green. And then it'll come to the major junction here. And if that traffic light is turned green, it will then completely take another turn into another road where it'll start synthesizing DNA. So this analogy with traffic lights and roadways is very, very uh, appropriate in my mind. The reason these systems exist and the level of complexity thereof is to guarantee that cells only progress to the next phase if their biochemistry is in order. We don't want broken cells going through a cell cycle and then producing offspring because those offspring may be damaged, they may be dangerous, or they may be mutant. Let's consider each phase of the cell cycle in a little bit more detail. Let's start by looking at G1, gap one. So cells are entering gap one, and during gap one, they can make a decision. So gap one is quite a long phase, and these decisions can be made early in gap one or later on in gap one, but certainly by the time the R point or the stop checkpoint is reached. And a cell may decide to do one of three things. The first thing is it could go into a temporary parking space where it's not ready, it doesn't have enough food, or it doesn't have enough energy, and it wants to make sure that it has an opportunity to do that. An alternative reason may be that at this time, that cell has enough partners. There's no need in the organism for more cells of that type just yet. So this is what happens with liver cells or with skin cells. An alternative is to go down an alternative pathway to terminal differentiation. That means the cell will forever forego any further rounds of cell division because it's now going to shut down that part of its chromosomes to do with the cell cycle and continue its life as a specialized cell. So in normal cases, neurons do this and some other cells in the body. But there's a third pathway, and that pathway is to go past the checkpoint and to go down the track, which is the cell cycle track. And cells may do that if there is a need for those cells to replicate. And this could be where you're replacing old cells, or you're repairing damaged cells, such as a cut, or you're growing as an organism. In order to understand this slide, let's look at two types of cell. Pretend that you are a liver cell and that I am a embryo, a fertilized egg. So let's start with you. That'll be option one. So you've just finished one round of cell division and your chromosomes have been segregated and you're now a daughter of a mother cell and you have a partner elsewhere in the room. So you have just completed a cell cycle. What the cell does, it removes all the cyclin proteins inside your cytoplasm and likewise in your sister cell. Why does a cell do this and how does it do it? Well, the reason is it wants to reset the landscape for the next round of cell division should that be necessary. The other reason it does it is to vacate all the cyclins so that the other cell can decide to go and do a job 
as a liver cell rather than divide immediately. And how does it do it? Well, we learned that earlier. There are mechanisms for adding ubiquitin to certain cyclins, but there's another method too, and that involves cyclin inhibitor proteins. So these are spe special proteins which go around inhibiting phosphorylation activity to do with kinases of cyclins. And they're released uh, from their sequestered locations. So this is one method. Now let's turn to me. I'm a dividing cell, and the main focus there is to rapidly go through one division to the next to the next. So in my case, it's not worth killing and destroying the cyclin proteins. So those proteins are left alone. And I will rapidly go from one cell division through G0 to G1 and then into S phase. And in that case, there's no need to destroy my cyclins. Cells are notorious for considering environmental conditions in regulating their biochemistry. And as I keep telling students, cells are really stupid and they're being controlled by the environment. So here's a great example of how the whole process can be interlinked by everything that we've learned over the course so far of this course. So here we have primary messengers coming in, and in this case, these are growth hormones or mitogens, and they regulate the behavior of the cell cycle in this cell. They bind to their receptor, and that causes a corresponding signal transduction process to take place, which activates the production of the cyclins, or even the cyclin-dependent kinases, if they already exist. They then go on to activate other components. So what you see here is one such example. In this case, the nucleus of this cell has transcription factors which are prevented from doing their job. And the reason they're prevented from doing their job is because they've been sequestered by another protein indicated in red here called retinoblastoma. Remember, this is a specific example of how this works. Retinoblastoma protein prevents the transcription factors from activating genes required for cell division. But when a signal approaches its cyclin, the cyclin is activated and it phosphorylates objects. It adds phosphate groups. And one of the things it adds phosphate groups to is the retinoblastoma protein. And you can see it here with two phosphates. That changes the configuration of the retinoblastoma. It no longer can bind to the transcription factors the transcription factors bind to the operators and enhancers of the genes, turning the genes on, gene expression ensues, and that produces new proteins, which can then go on and activate different phases of the cell cycle. So this is a very important slide for you to relate to other chapters and to revise uh, your information and your knowledge. Here is another example of something that can cause the cell cycle to stall or shut down. In this case, uh, the DNA has been damaged by ultraviolet radiation or x-rays. So the DNA has broken into pieces and that's detected by other proteins that we'll consider in subsequent chapters. And those proteins then have a cascade of events which result in the activation of a protein called P53. So P53 normally is present in the cell without being phosphorylated. And the only reason to phosphorylate P53 is if something is wrong. So in this case, there is something wrong, and that leads to the phosphorylation of P53. And you can see the phosphate group right there. And that causes a configuration change which activates the active site of P53. Now, P53 itself is a transcription factor. It binds to the promoter of many genes, one of which is called P21. And P21 is then expressed, here it is, this green, dark green object is P21, and P21 is a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor protein. What does it do? It grabs its target kinase and it wraps it up, therefore basically inactivating any further phosphorylation activity. This will ensue until and I like that word, ensue. This will ensue until the DNA has been repaired. Once the DNA damage is repaired, 
then the system will shut down and phosphorylate this green protein, which will then be removed, and the kinase will be restored to its fully active condition, therefore sending the cell into the next phase of the cell cycle. Depending on which phase of the cell cycle the cell is in when the problems materialize, there are some solutions. If things happen before the G1 checkpoint, then the cell has an opportunity, if something is wrong, to go backwards and park itself in G0. Should the challenge be unsurmountable, permanent, then the cell has an opportunity to permanently stop itself from entering the cell cycle, and those proteins are then shut down forever through biochemical changes. But there's an alternative pathway too, and this applies to cells that have already gone past the first checkpoint. So if the cell has already entered the deep part of the cell cycle, i.e. S phase or G2, then the cells are afforded time to fix their problems. So during the S phase, the cell will be prevented from progressing any further until DNA repair has accomplished the task of fixing any damage. But if time runs out, the cell runs out of energy, or the problem cannot be fixed, then the only outcome the cell will then enlist is to commit suicide. So the suicide program will be activated, and we'll see how that happens later on. But the suicide program is the default pathway that cells will follow if they cannot fix their problems in time. Let's now take a glimpse into the S phase at a deeper level. The goal of the cell cycle is twofold in this case. First is to copy the DNA from particular points called origins of replication. The second goal is to make sure that the same origin isn't used more than once so that we don't get duplicate origins of replication. And that's accomplished by this beautiful system of proteins being activated and deactivated in sequence. So let's start with G1. So this is the G1 phase, gap phase. So during the gap phase, the cell produces these blue proteins called origin recognition complexes, which sit down on all the origins within the DNA. And in the case of humans, there are thousands of these, thousands of these locations all over your chromosomes. But it also manufactures another protein known as CDC6, indicated in green here. That protein is necessary to bind to the origin recognition complex. The role that this protein plays is to recruit DNA helicase. So DNA helicase is looking for this combination, and once it finds it, it replaces the CDC6 with itself. In fact, two helicases are recruited, and they form this pre-RC, pre-replicative complex. And that happens at every single origin of replication. And the signals are sent to the cell that the origins are ready to be utilized should the cell reach that point. If everything else is okay, the cell will be sent into the S phase. And in the S phase, the production of this kinase, this cycling dependent kinase and its partner cycling, will reach a critical point. And they will then come along and activate through phosphorylation a bunch of different proteins, including our friend, the ORC. And the ORC will then initiate the separation of the two strands of DNA. The helicases will also be phosphorylated by our friend, the S phase cycling dependent kinase, and they too will then be sent on their way down each replication fork. And then what we learned in chapter six will ensue at this point. The CDC6 is broken down and destroyed so that it cannot bind again to the ORC. That way you're guaranteeing that no further helicases can start another round of DNA replication because there's no CDC6. So that's an important role that the cycling plays. It destroys the CDC6 as well as activating other proteins.
So here we have a combined effect, activating some proteins and deactivating others. If other types of DNA issues crop up, such as DNA replication errors, they can prevent the cell cycle from progressing into G2 and then into the M phase. So those quality control steps are performed after the S phase and during G2. And if things are not right, then the M phase cycling dependent kinase is inhibited by being phosphorylated by this system of quality controls. And those phosphates can be removed by another protein called CDC25. So CDC25 is the quality control molecule. So the brakes have been put on the M phase uh, cycling dependent kinase and the brakes can be removed by this protein. If there's DNA damage, this protein itself becomes phosphorylated. Oh my God. And in that situation, it cannot be functional. And for it to become functional, its phosphorylation has to be undone, has to be dephosphorylated. And that will only take place if everything is fine and the DNA damage has been repaired. So this multi-level system of quality controls and phosphorylation, dephosphorylation is a system that allows a web of cross checks to be performed inside a cell. And then the signal is sent up like a chain of command until it gets to the chief in charge, the president. And then the president will decide whether to send the cell into the next phase or not. Delving a little deeper into M phase, we can see that the importance of the M phase cycling dependent kinase is very important. So here it is, the M phase cycling dependent kinase, the complex. Its level begins to build up. So let me go back a few slides and take you back to a beginning slide such as this one where we were looking at the concentration of M cycling and its activity. So we're looking at something around here with that slide. But listen, let me mo move back into that slide. It's down here somewhere. There we go. So we're looking at that point. So the level of this cycling is beginning to build up, but this protein is inactive because it has been phosphorylated. And it stays in that state until other proteins have given the okay and the cell is about to be transitioned into mitosis. And then suddenly all these proteins will be activated at once. And the answer is simple. Uh, CDC25 becomes activated and it starts converting the inactive form of the MCDK into the active form. But not only that, because that will take some time, the active form of the MCDK, it not only has a target of many other proteins, but it also has a target on <coughs> CDC25 itself. And that causes further molecules of CDC25 to become activated, therefore driving even more of the inactive MCDKs to become activated. So this loop here, called a positive feedback loop, begins to pick up pace. And within a number of minutes, all the inactive mitotic CD, uh, the KKs are converted to the active form. So this happens really, really quickly, as we indicated in the figure, uh, this figure here. So this is the rise in activity of those products. Just two more concepts before we finish this video. The first of which has to do with the structure of the chromosomes. We know that during S phase, DNA is duplicated. And the duplicated DNA is kept side by side with the two copies. So here we have DNA duplicated through semi-conservative replication. So one of these strands of DNA on this side is the original. And on the other side, one of those strands is the original. And next to each, a new copy has been made. If you're not sure what we mean, please go back to chapter six. Now, once these copies are made, they're known as sister chromatids. But the sister chromatids have a tendency to float away from each other. So what the cell does during S phase, as it makes copies, right after the replication fork has progressed through this region, proteins 
such as these donut-shaped green proteins, are attached at various points along the chromosome to prevent the two sister chromatids from drifting apart. So those are called cohesin rings, and they are added, and they're very important in preventing uh, DNA from getting lost or distributed unevenly between the two daughter cells. So that takes place, and that's all part of the cell cycle process. There's a second set of proteins called condensins, which begin to do their tasks at the end of a G2 phase, and they wind up uh, tightening the DNA into ever larger loops, therefore causing the DNA to become tightly compressed, as in this case here. And that is a result that's initiated by the activity of our friend, the M stage dependent cyclin kinase complex. And that does so through, guess what, phosphorylation. So the proteins here in blue are phosphorylated, and when they become phosphorylated by this complex, they begin to then partake in their activities to form tightly enclosed rings of DNA. So condensins are activated at that point. Now both these proteins will subsequently be deactivated and destroyed because the functions that they perform are no longer needed. So the sister chromatids will be released during anaphase and they'll be destroyed immediately at that point so that the two sister chromatids can be separated to two different daughter cells. And later on, as those chromosomes begin to reform inside the nucleus, uh, the condensing rings will be removed and destroyed. The last concept we wish to consider in this video has to do with the previous chapter where we were looking at the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is very much involved in making sure that the right commodities end up in the right place. So microtubules, they form the mitotic spindle and they originate from the centrosomes, these structures here in light green, and they then either attach to each other or they attach to the kinetochores, uh, the centromeres of the chromosomes. And they pull and push the chromosomes so that the chromosomes are lined up at the metaphase plate during mitosis. The other type of cytoskeleton elements are the actin and the myosins. Just like we learned at the end of the last chapter, these two are able to interact with each other and form force generating structures. One of the things they form near the periphery of the margin of the cell at the equator is a contractile ring. And this contractile ring at the right time is activated to begin to constrict. And as it constricts, it brings the plasma membrane of the mother cell into close opposition until it pinches off and it produces two daughter cells. By the way, plant cells can't do this because they have a stiff cell wall and they have to employ a different strategy that we'll see later. So let's finish off this section of the chapter by reminding students that coming up in the next video we'll be concentrating on different stages of mitosis itself, the M phase. And that's broken up into five human-based stages, even though in reality it's a continuous process. But we humans like to break things down so we can divide and conquer. So prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And we'll learn what happens in those subdivisions. Thank you so much.